we're all home people, at least on those of us in this assembly hour. Can't study the Bible in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Personal sin needs to be dealt with. How do you do it? First John 1 John 1.9 says, confess your sin. Confess it. Identify it. Name it. Cite it to the Father. And he will forgive you and cleanse you and restore you to the ministry of the Holy Spirit because the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. Can't study it in carnality, nor can you live it. So you go ahead and work, do your priesthood, and then we'll have prayer. Father, we're so thankful for your grace and mercy and love. And tonight, Father, we thank you for the peace in our soul and the peace in our nation. And You know, we've been a blessed nation. They have no idea how blessed we have been, Father. We live in a, a, a time, a, a biblical time that says it's a time of war and rumors of war. And while it is, we have been protected on our shores. I suppose a lot of times we would like to take the boast for it, but the truth of the matter is, Father, it's by your mercy and grace and love. The church has been faithful and has been able to be the light to the world. I pray that we would continue that. It's not enough for us just to do it for our generation, but to train a second generation to carry the message forward properly and correctly and truthfully. So I pray tonight, Father, for those who have come by automobile and the Internet that we might understand what Christ has brought us in the sense of liberty and freedom and the price that was paid and the price that is continuously paid for it to the nation that honors God. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Sunday we looked at the perfect law of liberty and the emphasis on perfect is what it's connected to. And so in James 1.25, we connected it to the, the law. And this time we've connected it to liberty, as, as I've said. So therefore, the word teleos, it depends on where we've placed it, where the emphasis is on it. The word teleos in itself means perfect. The, in the English language, there are several ways it's translated in our, our English Bibles. In our text, it's translated perfect. It could be translated complete, finish, or end. Because that's the concept of the word teleos. In fact, even, even, it is, even the word mature is used with this word. Mature. In James 125, Sunday morning, we studied the perfect law that the perfect law points is a tutor. The perfect law, if it's perfect, if it reaches its goal or its end, is to point us to Christ. For example, look at your Bibles if you haven't memorized it. We quoted around here so much, you, you may already have it in your soul. But Galatians, the third chapter, verse 24 it gives us that that biblical that doctrinal truth about this principle 324 therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ that we may be justified by faith say that the point but now that faith has come we're no longer under a tutor. And then he goes on to talk about new covenant uh, adoption and, and uh, sonship and those type of things. See, the law is a tutor to lead us to Christ. And the, what the Jews did that brought discipline on their life which I'll talk about tomorrow night in the five cycles. We're going to look at the five cycles. What they did is they, 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 they threw God under the bus. They went to church and didn't honor him, didn't respect him, didn't pay homage to him in, in the ways God said, I, I am to be honored. 
The second thing they did, they threw Christ under the bus. In the Old Testament. They had, they had, they had shadow Christology without Christ. I mean, how can you have shadow Christology without Christ? Christology is Christ. And they just took Christ out of the Bible, uh, put him in some kind of mythical place of coming out some place in the wild blue yonder. Uh, and when he did come from out of the wild blue yonder, they murdered him. So, so they never really had any faith in what the prophets told them anyhow. So I want to show you something, though. I want to, I want to show you something tonight about this idea that the law is a tutor to bring you to Christ. Let me show you. Let me show you some a dynamic. Let me give you. Let me give you uh, something that many of you know. Maybe those on the internet haven't. But this is this is what's true about God and man. If man has if man is has positive volition towards God, God will give him gospel information. I don't care where he lives. There is no dark continent for him. In fact, he told the early church to go to the ends of the earth. And, uh, and they did it. <laughs> That's why we're here. We're probably, in their mind, at the end of the earth. And they did it. They did it. And they, listen, they did it successfully. Every generation has taken that banner and marched the gospel across the world. That's pretty amazing. Think about that. Not one generation has failed to do that. That's why we're here tonight in the 21st century. And America is an amazing ministry out of the church in America. We've carried that gospel every generation across the world. That's amazing. I was talking with Horton today. He's having lights out in Kentucky. Lights out. This week they'll reach over seven, 8,000 kids. I mean, it's just unbelievable. If a kid is sick, he still comes to school. He don't want to miss it. I told Gary today what Mr. Graham used to tell us. That he believed, and I think he's absolutely right, having worked with it, that 12% of those converted through missionary evangelism, what he, he considered himself to be, a missionary evangelist. I mean, he took the gospel to the world. That 12 percent, I don't know where he got this number, but I heard it all the time I was with him, that 12 percent of those converted will become missionary evangelists. You think about that. I told Gary that today. Gary, you have no idea what God is doing with you preaching the gospel in these schools, giving kids a chance. And I'll tell you. Just think about those numbers when you get through. Because there's a picture that maybe there's not been. I mean, I, never, I had never heard that. And Graham put that out. And I became a believer in that. I became a real believer in missionary evangelism and the effect it has on those who are converted by it. I was affected by it. I was converted by that type of message by a missionary evangelist. A Jew who had, <laughs> who had come to America. <laughs> A Jew would come to America. I mean, how good is that stuff? So I want to show you something. So here, here's a doctrinal principle. I want to show it to you in the Bible. I want to show it to you in a story that you're familiar with. So I picked one out. The, 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 the law is a tutor to bring you to Christ. And the reason that's important with missionary evangelism is because there's a principle in here about God and man. Man is a sinner and God, God and he's under judgment. And God will make every attempt to save that guy. It doesn't matter where he is. He'll either bring him out into the gospel or he'll take the gospel into the, the darkest places by missionary evangelists who have no fear in their soul about what's going to happen to them. You would think that sometimes when they come out of that and they get out of there by the skin of their teeth, they would never go back, but it's not true. Well, anyhow, there's a guy in Acts 10 and 11 Here's and th and it'd th be well worth your read later, but there's a guy 
in, in Acts 10 and 11 that intrigue me. I'm a writer to myself, and I love stories. So I write about these guys in, in, in fiction. What, what is it when it's not nonfiction? I write. I take a little bit of information from the Bible and then write a novel on it. Right, write stories on it. I don't know what that. I get them all mixed up, whether that's fiction or not. That's fiction. There's a guy there that I love and I write about in my own little journal. I never push this stuff out. I just like to do this, and I write about as much as I know about. It. Then I study Roman history. It's a guy called Cornelius. He's a Roman centurion. He's been sent to, to keep order, and I mean keep order. <laughs> centurion were tough. They were battle-ready people. They, he was sent into, into Israel to keep peace, he, and he's based at headquarters, operational headquarters in uh, Caesarea. And while he's been stationed as a, as a military guy, stationed in Caesarea on, on duty to keep peace in a, a conquered nation, Israel is conquered, they're, they're the conquerors in Israel, he becomes God conscious and realizes that he, what he grew up with was polytheism, many gods, yada, yada. When he got to Israel, apparently, see, God wants you to honor him, respect him, positive listen to the word God. When he got to Israel, he got a good dose of watching monotheism, one God, and he bought into it. Listen to how the Bible describes him. This is Cornelius in Acts 10 and 11. He's devout on monotheism. He's a devout monotheistic believer. He has a reverence for God. He gives alms to the Jews. He has a, an effective prayer life. By that, I mean a routine. He prays under the Jewish law, prays three times a day, sets three times, he sets a portion of time aside for prayer no matter what he's doing, right? It says that, he, he, that God speaks to him through visions. That was proper during, during that, uh, visions. And he tells him in a vision, he tells him that he wants to send an escort down to Joppa to the house of Simeon, to the house of Simon, and wants him to, to bring back a guy called Peter because he wants to have a conversation with him. In Joppa, God speaks to Peter's heart and tells him, there's some people going to come, knock on your door. They're Romans. It's okay. There's going to be a Roman detachment to come and get you. It's going to be okay. And when you get back, I want you to pop them with the gospel. That's my phrasing, of course. I want you to pop them with the gospel. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the pop and the, so this is what goes on. Now, see, you got a guy stationed. I mean, what are the odds? Stationed, Cornelius, stationed in Israel. Comes out of polytheism into monotheism. And just, it's just a, a breath of fresh air in his soul to have identity with God. And now God is ready to bring the gospel into his presence to see if he'll believe in his son. It's a pretty amazing deal. And this is how this stuff works, to tell you the truth. What, listen, wouldn't it be a wonderful wouldn't it be wonderful to be a player in this that God has set up? And we are, aren't we? We are. We're, we're somewhere. Listen, if you're faithful to do the things that God puts in your heart, and when the Spirit of God moves you, you move, you are a player in this kind of thing. And I want you to understand, it's, a, it's exciting to be one of these players where God speaks to your heart and says, why don't you go to 
guys are coming, Romans, Romans are coming for you. It's okay. They're going to take you. And when you get there, preach the gospel and all that. I mean, how wonderful it is. And we've all played them parts and didn't really know it maybe as it, as it was rolling. You know, we're one of the players. We don't know what the outcome is going to be until the game's over. But we're a player. And, and this is a, and in a wonderful story about this. Okay? So he's a Roman. And so they have this meeting. This meeting takes place, and he gets saved. He believes the gospel. Peter lays it out. He said, well, listen, God, the God that you serve, has another, another message for you, and this guy's ready for that message like he was the other one, that he sent his son to die on a cross for your sins, be buried and raised from the dead. If you believe it, you will be saved. And not only saved in time, but for eternity. And that's the next step in your life. Your next step in your life is to come to know God's Son in a very personal way. The Holy Spirit will dwell in your life and yada, yada. What a wonderful thing. And so he listens to the gospel. Listen, he has positive vision for God, but will he have positive vision for the gospel? Just because he's positive God doesn't mean he'll be positive the gospel. It just depends. So he sends Peter, and Peter goes in and explains it right out there. You're saved by grace through faith, not himself. It's a gift of God. Although you're an honorable guy, this is just about you meeting God. Listen, if you meet God, God wants you to meet his son, or this thing doesn't get tied up right. There's too many loose ends here. It, it doesn't. It, listen, God wants you to meet his son. So Peter's sent to introduce him to God's son. He, he knows about God, but he doesn't know about God's son because he's in a religion that don't teach him about the Christ person. And so he reaches over here outside his religion. He has to bring a guy over here in order to introduce him to the truth about God's son. It's now about God's son. And so he hears it and, and he believes. He becomes a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, we're familiar with that story and what a wonderful story it is. But here's where the story gets interesting to me. See, I love this story. But what I love is what might have happened. Because you see, he could very well be one of the lead guys in the fifth cycle of divine discipline to Israel. He's been sent to keep peace, but he may have to go to war. If he is not transferred or retires or dies in the next 40 years, 30-some 30, 30 years. He's going to be part of a mass cruel invasion from the inside because he hasn't been there just to keep peace. He knows every strategic military way to take that nation down quick if he has to. That's why he's there. So I find all that stuff intriguing to me. Now, I don't know because I don't know what age he was. I've got a pretty good idea. But the Father doesn't give us us clues, but I wonder about him. Because, you know, God had him for some great reason. I mean, I've written him being transferred to another place and, and becoming a missionary gospel guy. I've written him uh, retiring and going back uh, to his homeland. We don't know where he was from. He could have been from any of the conquered nations. I have him dying. I mean, there's so many ways. So, I, I, so I'm a guy that's just curious about this stuff. So if the story doesn't give me an ending, I write it. I write it. And I find great joy in that. My wife said, what are you going to do with all this stuff? And I said, I'm going to throw it in the trash. If I don't, my kids will. They just throw it away. Right? It's just junk. And uh, it, it's just the way that I like to do that. But there, but there, my story is there's Cornelius. There's the, the, the law leads you to Christ. And when it does, then the law is done 
and Christ is in, right? And Cornelius is a great example of that. The problem is we don't know any further in it, but it could be quite a, quite a deal, wouldn't it? If he was a young guy and spent his last 30 years there, and this was the, the worst day of his life as far as the choices he has to make. But anyhow, I just find that stuff interesting. I find that interesting because God is in control of all this, doesn't it? One thing for sure, God is in control of human history. That includes you and me. So the perfect law, the, the, perfect, the, the perfect law, how about the perfect law of liberty? Just think about what he went through when he met Christ and he comes into the book idea of Galatians 5.1. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. Christ set you free for freedom is what that actually says. Think about that. I mean, he's been sent to a place with the idea of liberty. We liberate uh, or, or put him in bondage. We, we either do one or the other. And, and now he's met, this, he's met this word liberty, this word freedom in a whole new way, just like he met God in a whole new way. I just find that stuff interesting. In James 2.12, the emphasis is on, the per, on perfect liberty. And that's led me to my study today. I want you to look at Galatians 5.1 uh, just a moment with me again, if you would. We're in the book of Galatians, I guess. Here's 5.1 because we looked at Galatians 3.24. It says, it was for, remember I told you, I think it was Sunday, that, that those words are not literally in the text. And so it, it begins, uh, freedom that Christ set us free, or Christ set us free for freedom. The emphasis is freedom. When you put it on the front like that, it doesn't make sense. Freedom for Christ set me free. It doesn't make sense. So, but the emphasis is on the freedom. It's on the liberty. And so when you, when you put it properly in uh, the words, and it's Christ set me free for freedom. And look, and then, and then the, the, if you read, if you read uh, on past 5, 1, and go into 5, 2, 3, 4, he's talking about the law and the slavery of the law. He's talking about this lady. And, and he said, listen, there's the, for you people, the Galatians said, listen, the law is one form of slavery and your old sin nature is another form of slavery. There's a lot of for, f forms of slavery is what he said. That is in opposition to the freedom that Christ sets you free. Christ sets you free for what? For freedom. Therefore, live in freedom. I mean, why would you live any other way? And so... James is trying to encourage. So here are seven things. Here are seven, seven things that Christ sets you free for freedom. Here, and I want you to, I want you to see if you live in perfect freedom. I'm going to show you some signs of perfect freedom. Perfect freedom. Point number one. And listen, each one of these, I got seven. I'm going to bust through them. I know you get scared when I put seven up there, but. We're going to go through them, and each of these is a sign of your maturing, spiritual maturing. Each one of these. If you go like, okay, I got that one, Ron. That's a sign of your maturing, and I want you to be able to see this. Here's point one. And these are not definitely in, the, in order. I just put them down. Here are seven. <laughs> They're not necessarily in any order. If it's in an order, it wasn't intentional. Okay. It is perfect liberty when a believer knows that is better to struggle with spiritual freedom than with spiritual bondage. See? It is perfect liberty. It, it, perfect liberty is Christ set us free for freedom. When a believer comes to know that, now I tell you, after a while, you've been in the Christian faith a while, that doesn't seem like a biggie. That's a biggie. That's really a biggie. Uh, the, per, the perfect liberty when a believer knows that it's better to struggle with spiritual freedom than with spiritual bondage. In, in Romans, the sixth chapter, I, I'm going to turn over there. I'm going to read a little bit of this. In Romans, the sixth chapter, Romans 6, and I picked this, I picked this up with Paul from, I think, about verse 12, uh, 12 through 20-something. Tw and, and listen to what he says, and he talks about freedom and slavery. He said, therefore, do not let sin reign, reign, that, that's lordship type of deal, 
do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. Now, he's talking about the sin nature. And do not go on pre presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those alive from the dead, spiritually, and your members, the members of your body, as instruments of righteousness to God. Now, who's in charge of this operation? You are. That's the word presenting. You're in charge of this. You're in charge of this. Then he goes on in verse 5, For sin shall not be master over you. Why? Because, you, listen, you have the Holy Spirit in you. It should never be master over you. You have the Holy Spirit in you. That is the master over the flesh, right? Of course, Galatians 5, 16, 17. Sin shall not be master over you, for you're not under the law. You're under grace. Law can't do that. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? No, that's not the, that's not the answer. Do you not know? When you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death, that's temporal, or of, of obedience resulting in righteousness. See, these are in opposition. This is a warfare. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from slave through Christ, you've become slaves of righteousness for God. I am speaking in human terms, in illustration, because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. He's talking about temporal. Talking about death and life. But... Now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefits resulted in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. And, that, and then he goes on. And so he, what he, listen, when you come to realize this stuff, when, when you go like, yeah, Ron, I'm right with you, I understand it, that's a sign of your maturing. Because you understand what's going on and you understand that you can win over this you do not let this master you you don't let it reign over you you reign over it but you can't do it in the flesh you have to do it in the power of the spirit you have to do it personally it, it's a battle you battle every day it's a, a warfare that continues to go on because you're alive okay but what I want you to see is that when you see the struggle, don't become discouraged. It's a sign of maturity that you see it. Think how many don't see it. The fact that you see it and understand the options that you have that are real, tangible, and if you... See, that's understanding perfect liberty. I have this freedom. I live in the sense of freedom. But it, I want to live... Free in Christ. I don't want to be a slave to my sin nature. I don't want to be a slave to the other options I have, as, as, as the writer Paul mentions here. Here's the second one. Here's the second one. It is perfect liberty when you know that conviction of personal sin by one's conscience is a sign of spiritual maturing in the Word of God. Did you get that? A listen, a conviction of the conscience. That, see, that's Romans 320, 3.20. Here's, what it, here's the basics of that. Through, not, through the knowledge of the word, uh, uh, it is through the knowledge of the word, that, that it is through the Bible that we have knowledge of sin. 
it is through the word of God that we have knowledge of sin. How do we know what sin is? The Bible tells us. So the fact, listen, the fact that you can confess sin and go like, look, when I say mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, over sins, listen, the Bible tells you what, you know, anger and all those things. The Bible tells you. And listen, the more you study the Bible, the bigger the list gets and the better you are for it because it's a sign of maturing when you hear confess your sins. The fact that you know that it's sin and it separates you from fellowship is just an enormous sign of maturing. I want you to see those are positive signs in your life. You see, those are positives. That's a sign of maturing. It's, sign, it's a sign that you've brought into an, a, 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 an acute awareness of perfect liberty. Here's a third one. It is perfect liberty when your spirit, when your spirit is grieved and sorrowful because of personal sin. That's a sign of maturing. It shows that you have personally become familiar with walking by means of the Holy Spirit or your spirit wouldn't be grieved or quenched when the spirit is not operating. The fact that that's true, that it's not just the conscience that convicts me, but it's actually my spirit. When the spirit convicts you, you're into inner dialogue. You're into inner dialogue in a very spiritual way. Not just an inner dialogue with, I shouldn't be doing that because that's sin. I'm in an inner dialogue. Beyond that, I'm in a more mature place in my life that says, it grieves. Listen, this grieves the Holy Spirit. It quenches the Holy Spirit from working in my life. And I don't want to be without that. You've become familiar with the ministry of the Holy Spirit trumps what your desires would be to break that, to break that, that cycle of spirituality in your life. You don't want to break it. Do you understand what I mean? When that occurs, when, the, when your spirit becomes grieved with the Holy Spirit and quenched, when you know those things, that's a sign of maturing. That's a, listen, and the wonderful thing about that, it's a sign of maturing in the perfect liberty. It's all about Christ set me free for freedom, and it's living in that freedom that I've been set free to live in. Is it, does that make sense to you? Here's the fourth one. I gave you scriptures on those in those points. The fourth one, it is perfect liberty when you know, as a believer, when you know that personal sin breaks fellowship, but not relationship with God as your father. It breaks fellowship with him but it doesn't break relationship. And that's really important. That's a sign of maturing. And that's a wonderful sign. And it shows that you have now bought into the realm of living in the freedom that Christ sets you free to live. You don't want to be without fellowship with the Father. You don't want to be without that. I don't want that. And so when choices come up now in my life, I choose to stay connected to the Father, not break, not break fellowship with him. I want to be in fellowship. I don't want to do that. I don't want to break fellowship with the Father. It's too exciting to travel with the Father. There's so much goes on when you travel with the Father. I don't want to break that. I don't want to miss anything in traveling with the Father that he has. It's an exciting journey every day of my life. Every day, I don't... I don't want to break fellowship because I don't want to miss anything. Maybe I'm just a nosy guy. I don't know. But I don't want to miss anything. It's too way exciting. I mean, he's where the action is. The action that I'm interested in, that's where he is. It's the most exciting place ever to be in that, that, that cycle of where God is moving dynamically. And I don't want to miss it. I don't, I want, if I, if I have the opportunity to participate, I want to participate. If not, I want to be a spectator. I don't want to miss it. 
And that shows a sign of maturing in your life. And this is a good thing. This is a good thing. And I want you, I think sometimes we beat ourselves up on so many issues that we shouldn't beat ourselves up because we should pat on our back that we are where we are. Because you're making a wonderful journey. I've got you into four steps. I've, I've got you into four steps in this journey of living in the dynamics of perfect liberty. And it's important you see these things and not beat yourself up. It's important for you to, to understand what God's trying to brag on you. You, you need to see that. Here's a, here's a fifth one. And, and by the way, I gave, you some, I gave you some really good scriptures. I hope you'll read them out of Romans 8, 1 through 4 and 14 through 17. They are really good. They are really good. That Romans 8 is just lights out people. And, and the prodigal son is a good example of that. When you break fellowship, you don't break relationship, right? The prodigal son out of, out of Luke 15, that parable. It's a great example of that. I mean, the father, the father grieves for the absence of the child, doesn't he? And finally, the child grieves for absence of the father, and now we got something working, haven't we? And he leaves the bondage to go back to the freedom and thinks he's got to take another role, you know, just because he spent too much time in the world and lost the the sense of belonging with God. You know, it's a terrible thing when a Christian gets so deep into the muck and mire that he loses the sense of belonging. Do you know that the sense of belonging, you can, you can drift so far away from God that you don't think you belong. And that's, that's a lie of the pit from hell. That is the biggest lie you could ever buy into your life. Because the prodigal son tells you that's not true, right? That's not true. That's not true. Devil would like to have you believe that. As long as you got breath in your life, listen, listen, you can climb out of any mess in your life and move back into, listen, Christ died on that cross that you believe in to set you free and to put you in it as severe of perfect freedom. And when you, when you, when, listen, my point to you tonight is that when you see this in your life, when you experience this in life, when you have a realization of this, when you put your finger on it and it's a doctrinal truth, listen, that ought to encourage you. I want to bring a message of encouragement to you tonight. The fact that you know these things in your soul shows that you're in a, you're in a system of maturing. So don't, don't beat yourself up. Don't let other people do it to you. Listen to the word of God. Listen, the fact that you know this, you're way ahead of the game. Now it's a matter of exercising it. But the fact that you know it shows a sign of maturity. You understand? These are really big signs of maturity. And I think sometimes we get so grown up in the, in the faith that sometimes we miss these little clues that we have that show us that we're really doing better than we think. And God has put on my heart tonight to just encourage you with this. Here's a fifth one. It is perfect liberty when you know that personal sin is carnality and confession of it to the Father restores spirituality. Do you realize that's a great sign of maturity in your life to know that? And to have exercised it, whether you're doing it now or not, but to know it to be the truth. You know what a wonderful, and listen, you know, you know the power of 1 John 1, 9. It brings you back into the spiritual life. And, and listen, the one person that knows that is you. And that's the truth. I mean, there is, there is real freedom in spirituality, and there's real bondage in carnality. I mean, real bondage. And confession of sin is able to move you in light speed from one position to another one in light speed. Do you understand that? A prayer leaves earth, touches the throne of heaven beyond light speed, beyond it, and change is automatic. You're now... 
you have just moved yourself from, from one position to another position in light speed. Call prayer, a confession, a prayer confession. <laughs> That's amazing to me. Now, it took six hours on the cross to get that. It took six hours on the cross to be able to put that prayer in light speed to heaven and back. It's up to you whether or not you think it was worth it. See, for me, it was worth it. I thank him every day. That was worth it. And therefore, I don't want to be carnal. And when I am, I don't want to stay in it. I'm going to confess my sin and get out of it because I appreciate the six hours on the cross that gives me light, speed, and confession. That's a sign of maturity. Don't sit around and beat yourself up. Just get back with the program. Get yourself back up and get back in the game. This is a good thing. This is a sign of maturity. You know how many people don't know? That was number five, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. Don't, listen, don't live in carnality. But the fact that you know this, the fact that I'm speaking to you tonight, and you go like, I know that, Ron. I know, but do you know that this, this is perfect liberty that, that he's talking about for your life? This is liberty. You know, perfect liberty is a liberty that only God can give you. There's nobody can give you that. Don't look for anybody to give that to you. Only God gives it to you. And he gives it to you. Listen to me. He gives it to you by grace. It's a gift. It's a wonderful sign of maturity that you know this. The fact that you know this. See, I'm now at five. You know what I want to tell you tonight? You're so much more mature than you think you are. Because I haven't, I haven't told you anything tonight that you people don't know. You've heard all this. And if you believe it, and you look at those scriptures and say, yeah, I see that. I believe that. I, don't, I remember those scriptures. I know that. You understand how deep into the system that God has of spiritual, you realize how deep into spirituality you are right now and never realized it. And hopefully tonight I can bring that to you. And listen, the fact that you're at, if you're with me at five, you're going to be with me at six and seven. If you are, listen, we're the people that have a message for others. Do you know how many people that don't know one, two, and three, let alone seven? And listen, I just quit at seven because I'm, I'm time constrained. But my message tonight is in be, be of good courage, brothers and sisters. Be of good courage. Here's the sixth. It's perfect liberty when you know that Carnality is a byproduct of the sin nature and human volition. And people, they get into this and they beat themselves up. You, listen, don't beat yourself up and don't beat other people up because, listen, Jesus took the beating that we could be released by grace, right? Not by, not by any work system out. You don't work your way out. You confess your sin out. But listen, the issue is it's perfect liberty when you know that carnality is a byproduct of the old sin nature and volition. Team it up. You know, that's at James 1, 14 and 15. Carried away and enticed, giving birth to sin. Right? Giving birth to sin and death, temporal death. That's out of fellowship in a state of carnality is that state. Listen, just to know this and to believe it shows sign of maturity in your life. How did, I mean, you realize how much you really know and believe that can be applied to your life? to live a victorious life in Christ? And do you not realize that the information that you have, other people need to hear it, and they need to hear it from somebody 
who, who has heard it, who believes it, who is living it, who struggles with it, and that's okay. Right? Listen, you're going to struggle through. Listen, you got flesh till the day you die. You're not going to get out of this thing. Listen, just, everybody struggles. Everybody struggles at some level in this arena of the perfect liberty. Everybody struggles. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin not to correct it. So I gave you James 1, 14 and 15 and other passages. Here's my final point. It is perfect liberty when you know that if you do not confess your sin, you will be disciplined by the love of the Lord. It doesn't discipline you. It's not going to discipline you out of anger and meanness and any of that stuff. He's not going to punish you. He's going to try to bring you into restoration. I mean, sometimes he just lets us waller in our mess. Because we, he, listen, when he does, he knows he's, you got it inside you to pull yourself out of here. And I'm not, I'm not talking about human will. I mean by the will of God. Listen, he left the prodigal son, let him waller, 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 till he what? Came to his senses. And where did that come from? It came from a word of God in his soul that said, I'm better off with the Father than I am with the world. I'm better off with God than I am with the world. I'm going home. I'm going home. Now listen, it would be nice not to have to get yourself a wallering in the muck and mire of the world to get to that place when you already had the word before, before you left home. You had the word. But thank God you had the word because he let you. Sometimes he doesn't have to bring discipline on you because the sin has done it. He just lets you waller in it, and then he lets you see if you come to the senses before he makes a move on you to see if you, if you can walk out of that thing because you got the word in you that says, I'm going to go home to the Father. I know he'll take me back. He probably won't take me back as a son, but as a servant. I'm better off in his house than I am here. I want to go back to the house of God. I, I'm tired of the house of the world. Pretty powerful idea. And listen, when the father disciplines, he dis disciplines you out of love. I mean, love says, I want my child to work his way through it. I'm going to wait and see if my, if my child can work his way through it. Wouldn't it be better to watch his child come out knowing who he is in the Lord rather than me rescue him? I'm going to let him, I'm going to let him see what he does. And if he can't make that, I'm going to reach in there and pull him out, right? Now, God does that. I mean, his whole disciplinary program, he has a three-step program. It's all about, it's all about getting us back to the place that we can make good choices in our life, not bad ones, based on the truth of the word of God. And see, this is, this is a sign of maturing in your life. See? And if, if you know these seven things, then these are, these are pillars to me. These, for me, these were pillars in my life. These were great stepping stones, and they still are pillars. They're the pillars for me. And uh, the fact that you know this, and the fact that you're, you, you have all the tools by grace, you have the indwelling of the Spirit, you have the Word of God, you have a phenomenal church. You, listen, we may be small, but we're a phenomenal group of people. We're phenomenal. We have so much to offer, and I know you offer a lot. Believe me, I know that. But sometimes we need to be coached and encouraged. And my message tonight is to coach you up. I mean, we're a good team. And we're doing great things. And sometimes we can just get bogged down in all of the stuff. Even, even, the, even ministry stuff. And have to be, just step back a minute and just, I want to have you step back a moment and, and understand that when it says Christ set us free for freedom, what that freedom means and how much it, you have and don't realize it, you have that freedom because the word of God tells you you have it. And then when, you, when he tells you have it, he tells you how you can keep, keep it. 
You understand? And it's full operational as assets. And that's the point. I mean, he doesn't give it to you and then you have to keep it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you get it and all the grace operating assets that he gives you, these are operational to keep you there. Okay? All right. Well, that was my second half message I was going to bring Sunday. And I didn't want to leave it on the burner any longer. I wanted to bring it back Tuesday night for sure. Be encouraged. You you are you are phenomenal more than you realize. You are phenomenal. The information you have is lights out, and it's in your soul, not just in your Bible. And that's what that's that's where you live the perfect freedom. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these who have come our way by the automobile and by the internet. I pray, Father, tonight that. Believers who are in the sound of our voice tonight and for many other nights when they'll click in and pick up this doctrinal lesson would find the encouragement they need. Walk with God. Don't walk with the world. Get out of the world. By that I mean we're in the world but not of it. Let God be your light. Let, let Jesus Christ, when he says, I am the light of the world, let, it sh let him shine. Let him shine. We carry him places individually that other people will never carry him just because of the way we are contacted with people. May we be that light. May we be that sign of encouragement to others. And may we find that encouragement in ourselves. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.